welcome to Totally Unrelated, a place for big ideas, brain farts, and the occasional venting session. My name's Diana. And I am Irina. And we'll be doing what we do best, rolling our eyes at each new mutation of humanity's stupidity gene and the conditions that bring these about. A brief recap of the last episode. We've talked about the general context that allowed proto-fascist ideas in the 19th century to gain some traction and win over hearts and minds, only to become policy within a generation or two. We've seen how pseudoscientific notions put forward by Galton have justify existing class, racial and gender oppression, how many members of the middle class felt threatened by both the rapid pace of technological innovation but also increasingly by the growing presence of worker parties, the suffragettes, and anti-colonial voices. These things in turn drove many to seek meaning and escape in myths, the occult, and folklore. We've seen the contribution of Russian adventurist Yelena Blavatsky to the emergence of the spiritualist movement in Europe, as well as the influence of Guido von Liszt's occult and folklore-inspired fan fiction. And because last episode ended on a rather gloomy note, I want to get back to our happy place. Let's talk about fanfiction and fandoms before we get to the second proto-fascist writer. I sort of want to uh, tie this in uh, again with the whole fanfiction thing and how, uh, as I as I said, uh, currently it's much more about providing an outlet, a creative outlet for many people and um, helping people to deal maybe with the difficult moments in their life or just try a new idea uh, and uh, how uh, for some um, this sort of community ends up having a, an impact in a, actually a good way yeah sure I mean you know I'm the you are you are you are the fan fiction uh, yeah, it's, specialist it's very weird that you're sort of into a lot of the so let's call it geekier stuff than me like you're the dungeon and dragon player and video game player and yet um you're not much into fandoms i don't know what, I, what is it do you hate people <laughs> <laughs> i mean i i try but usually i the things that i i would find interesting people be- don't need to know you are a hipster yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, I just don't find as many people writing about the characters that I find interesting. See, this is probably how your guys felt. They knew they were special. Yeah. And they, they just yeah. weren't finding the right people. So they went up and created their own yeah. little bubble. So beware, Diana. Yeah. I... So... <laughs> That's why I try to stay away from it. <laughs> um... I know that when I go to archive of our own, I can become very dark. <laughs> So, um, you know, I guess um, telling and retelling stories can have a lot of reasoning behind it. It can be some craziest shit reason like um, these guys had. But a lot of people, at least in the very non-Nazi experience that I've been having. (laughs) (laughs) Extremely non-Nazi. What's up with all this non-Nazi experience? Yeah. (laughs) Um, Kids these days. Yeah, so uh, some play with the story simply because they enjoy it. I mean, it seems like the obvious thing, Mm -hmm. uh, the obvious reason, and most of the time it is the reason. And other play with the story specifically because they are frustrated with it. I mean, many fic writers see the potential a story has to become what they see as the true good way to tell that story. But the original takes a bad turn somewhere and then frustration leads to creation. So basically this is uh, the exercise that you do many a times when you're a child and yeah. uh, you, you know, after you watch whatever you were watching or reading, you go, but then what do they do the rest of the day? <laughs> Pretty much, or, you know, you just tell it again, only you are the hero. Yeah. Um, So the creation of a divergence from canon, or a complete alternate universe, sometimes happens. And it is hard to explain why some stories drive the creation of a tone of derivative works, and others don't. 
Uh, and after a decade uh, in fandom and deep in fan fictions, I'm still not able to say what it uh, makes me look at somewhat a normal story and go, I wonder what this character would do in a zombie apocalypse in space. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> or what does this character, what does this story need? A bit of centrification. Yeah, sure. Or like, <laughs> I, I really need this, the same thing, only with tentacles, you know? Yeah. Uh, but while I do enjoy the occasional complete crack fix, those are not my main jam. And uh, I love the stories that even if they might be a form of escapism, they bring new ideas and new feelings and new ways of exploring my, the mind of others. But, um, uh, well, somehow crack and porn and <laughs> deep seas... <laughs> Wait, what? Porn? <laughs> well, well, crack and porn. And when I say crack, I mean uh, insane storytelling and not the drugs. Uh, and, Damn it. And deep serious stories, they bring together a lot of people. You know, you have um, some meaningf meaningful stuff. A some... lot of people to share in the crack and the porn. And the deep stories. Oh, of course. The, the, you know. the, oh, I mean, I love to share a plot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a lot of people end up, um, a lot of the writers end up actually having a lot of power in the fandom. Um, I read fix in like six fandoms so far, but only in two of them I was engaged enough with the people to see... Um, some of that power within fandom turn into action in the real world. What do you mean by power? I mean, you you sort of start to, to feel like there is this energy, everybody's talking about the same thing and loving the same thing mm -hmm. and are really into talking with each other and sharing and um, feeling that there is something special going on there and somehow the world should know. It sounds slightly culty when you put it like that. It, it <laughs> is culty. It, it is. I mean, I guess it It only... It, it doesn't feel culty when you're inside of it. No, right? I guess that's the whole thing. Yeah. But um, I, I guess it, it's quite easy to channel that energy into good or into bad, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think my supernatural experience, and I mean supernatural is in the TV series. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't see like all the ancient Germans no, fighting no. the Romans and you didn't no. bury and, your, and also I did your not... beer bottles in no. the shape and also of I did swastika. not met uh, Zalmolkse. And... Oh, damn it. No. <laughs> and, um... You need Zalmolkses in your life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the TV series, as I said, uh, my supernatural experience, I think is the most important example uh, about uh, turning this high energy into action and um, I think the, the, the most actually serious example is um, this um, scavenger hunt actually uh, it's called GISH WESH <laughs> I mean that's an acronym um, and it's a week-long international scavenger hunt and it started like a publicity stunt um, I, I actually I told you the story of uh, the publicity stunt, but anyway, uh, it turned into a Guinness record breaking thing where up to 14,000 people from all over the world came together to have fun and do crazy shit like the largest gathering of people dressed as French maids. Yes, I see a lot of potential. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a real thing and it's been documented by Guinness. Uh, but also do amazing things. Uh, some what? this was pretty amazing, though. It, it it was. I mean, imagine it. What, because... Was it was it just women? No. Ah. <laughs> I, so, like I said, I see a lot of potential there. It, it is. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but also they did genuinely good things. Uh, some small, like uh, random acts of kindness. Um, like or... dressing up as a French maid. <laughs> Um, you know, enrolling to become a bone manor donor or donating money to charities or, abend uh, or adopting abandoned pets or um, even the biggest online album with pictures of hugs. That This was also a Guinness documented thing. Okay. And uh, some more significant like uh, building homes in um, um, uh, other countries after earthquakes or offering homes to Syrian refugees. Also, they founded a farm 
and um, food cooperatives for uh, people in Rwanda uh, that were uh, genocide survivors. Uh, all these people genuinely came together and went to all those countries mm-hmm. and provided support uh, for a ballet school, uh, for at-risk children in South Africa. Uh, and it is a yearly thing. Um, and every year they do different mm-hmm. things. Some of them crazy stuff, like, yeah. you know, the French maids. Um, and they end up on the news every time it happens because they do something crazy, like having mm-hmm. a Zeppelin or something like that. Uh, but also they genuinely do good things. So you can have free healthcare, but uh, once a year you have to dress up as a French maid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my days of watching Supernatural are long over, but my love for what the cast, together with the fandom, accomplished through all those years, it's honestly, it's never ending. And I know it sounds pathetic, but <laughs> yeah, I guess I, I really understand how the people who manage to end, end up in a community uh, find it hard to do, to leave mm-hmm. because I ended up watching like three more years of this crap show <laughs> 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 way past uh, its prime time just because I genuinely enjoyed the um, community. Mm-hmm. So, but it was a community who fortunately channeled its energy for good things. Mm-hmm. But who knows, maybe I could have become a Nazi. And how is the community doing now? It's maybe they've turned No, no, they didn't. No. no. They didn't turn dark. No. I mean, there's <laughs> always some crazy people in yeah, in, yeah, in, yeah. in every community. Mm-hmm. But not enough to go from, you know, um donating blood and bone marrow to becoming a Nazi. Yeah. <laughs> It's also interesting, uh, you know, when uh, I hear people uh, mobilizing and doing uh, things like this, that uh, the whole discussion that uh, many a times uh, people have about, oh, yes, you know, I know that the world would be a nice place the way you maybe argue it should be, but, you know, human nature. Mm -hmm. It's like, but... I mean, human nature Even is the so. Is crying. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, because it's a stupid argument. Because, <laughs> like, what, 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 what actually is human nature? Because it's very, it's a, it's very d- dependent on the circumstances that you put people in. Of course. Because I, I cannot think of anyone, either of myself or anyone I truly sort of cherish and admire as, as you know, as people and their character. I, I, I can't imagine anyone uh, when they are under sort of a major stress or, uh, uh, and I don't mean the day-to-day sort of, of stress, course, but of like a, a really terrible situation or uh, having constantly uh, this idea that uh, they just go from uh, bad to worse and that they wouldn't eventually do things that they wouldn't be proud of Mm -hmm. so you know it's it's not necessarily about this fixed character that people have or don't have of course or or yeah but if it fits your narrative to say that yeah we would like to do things better but we can't because human nature yeah and also um, there are only people who are just sort of born good and people who are born bad. And oh, it just happens that uh, we are the good ones. Sure. <laughs> and the bad ones are actually monsters. You cannot do anything about them because it's just in, in their nature. And we tried, but really we cannot because it's and, human nature. <laughs> yes, and, and their badness, it's something like out of this world, you know. This is this is what always pisses me off in the discussion because we're talking about, um, you know, people actually turning into actual Nazis. Mm. Uh, but this idea that somehow I don't know this um, desire for bad things was uh, somehow from the heavens or something, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, it it was definitely unstoppable by actual human actions mm-hmm. and by noticing things that happened before things turned really, really bad. Yeah. 
Oh well. Back to our Austrian patient. Uh, I promise you we had some more crazy on the menu. Uh, the man who styled himself Jörg Lanz von Liebenfels and uh, claimed to have been born in 1872 in Lesiria, the son of Baron Johann Lanz de Liebenfels, was actually born in 1874 in Vienna. So he made himself older. Okay. But mm. only by two years. Yeah. <laughs> That's a waste of a lie. I know. Okay. okay so he was born uh, Adolf <laughs> Josef. <laughs> mm. It's a perfectly nice name. I don't know if you if you were to choose a fancy name why you would go for York. But eh, okay, I guess beggars can be choosers. Uh, yeah. Contrary to his adult fantasy of aristocratic and Sicilian origins, he was brought up by middle class parents who were descended on the paternal side from a long line of Viennese burghers. <laughs> Goodrich Clark writes During his childhood, he acquired a romantic interest in the medieval past and its religious orders, which he revered as the spiritual elite of a remote age. By his own and often unreliable account, he developed an enthusiasm for the military order of the Templar Knights and steeped himself in fanciful lore concerning their castles and legends. These sentiments may have motivated his decision to enter the Cistercian novitiate as at Heiligenkreuz Abbey near Vienna. Despite opposition from his family, he was inducted to, into the order as Brother Georg on uh, the 31st of July, 1893. While monastic life fulfilled his sentimental desire for identification with the old holy elites, these years at Heiligenkreuz also gave him an exceptional opportunity to extend his education under the learned tutelage of his novice master, Nivard Schlobel, who professed the Old Testament and Oriental languages. Lance's uh, later writings bear the stamp of a thorough grounding in Bible knowledge, the exegesis of rare apocryphal agnostic texts, and the religious traditions and languages of the Near East. He was also an assiduous student of Yabis history and published his studies in several learned journals. So whoever said that education is good for people? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess when I first began to play um, RPGs, I, uh, I wondered why would you have different sets for intelligence and wisdom? Mm -hmm. But... Um, yeah, and I was wondering, how could you have uh, characters that have a very high intelligence, yet abysmal wisdom? Well, I mean... <laughs> and later in life... Yes, and later in life. Yes. you managed to find out. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we get a first glimpse of Liebenthal's view of the world when he writes about a, a relief from an excavated okay. tombstone in 1894. His interpretation of a pretty common scene of a nobleman slaying a beast uh, really goes off the rail when he concludes that the scene isn't merely an allegorical rendition of the fight between the forces of good and evil, as you know most people would assume, uh, but that evil in the world is linked to the existence of, existence of subhumans. Of course. So weird flex. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it is because I, I know you uh, weren't brought up particularly religious. I was, uh, but I was I was brought up not <laughs> religious at all. In any way religious. <laughs> yes. Uh, but even even uh, I, I, I guess even from a, uh, a strictly sort of uh, cultural point of view, like you just absorb certain symbols and imagery and meanings of uh, uh, statues or of uh, paintings. And, you know, a, a, a mounted uh, 
warrior with a spear slaying a dragon or a beast like yeah, this is pretty common ba ba basic stuff yeah this is pretty basic stuff you know the, the fact that you go from there from you know the brave chivalrous knight slaying the dragon or slaying the you know yeah yeah i mean the dragon who who is the incarnation of evil but it's like it is a dragon to well actually the dragon <laughs> is a subhuman so i <laughs> yeah. mean okay so let's uh, let's uh, let's uh, see more uh, about uh, this uh, interesting uh, interesting boy he began to study zoology <laughs> in order to find a solution to this problem which he alone created taking the scriptures uh, apocrypha, modern archaeological discoveries, and anthropology as his further study sources, uh, Lance assimilated uh, current racist ideas uh, into a dualistic religion. He finally identified the blue-eyed, blonde-haired Aryan race as defied by such contemporary social Darwinist writers as Karl Penka, Ludwig Woltmann, and Ludwig Wilser as the good principle and the various dark races of Negroes, Mongols, and Mediterraneanoids as the evil principle. I mean, honestly, I'm so sorry for Darwin. I mean, the amount of people on all sides that just decided to take stuff from his writing and just go nuts with it. <laughs> this is what happens when you go viral. Yeah. <laughs> you stop having you stop having like ownership of your idea. Yeah. The de death of the author before it was, you yeah. know, an actual thing. Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is fascinating though that basically uh, I mean, obviously, his uh, book and his ideas were imperfect because, you know, he was the first to actually start and put things together. And, you know, obviously, the, 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 the original idea itself, the original book and his studies had their own flaws. But I think most of the w weirdness and craziness uh, that these people uh, then derive from it, derive from it is, well, partially a total misunderstanding of what his theory is about and then obviously just cynicism just using a misrepresentation of it for whatever their goal was okay so in 1899 he leaves the monastic order uh, according to the abbey's register on account of his surrender to the lies of the world and carnal love mm -hmm. Leeuwenthal's, on the other hand, claims his exit is due to the order's betrayal of its original doctrines, uh, by which he means racist. So <laughs> he pulls a Depardieu and leaves there as because they were simply not racist enough for him, I guess. Well, apparently that can also happen. Okay. Um, after leaving the order, he begins dabbing, dabbling in everything from science. He's a dabbler. Uh, science, uh, anthropology, mythology, etc. <laughs> he begins an investigation into ancient mystery, orgiastic cults, and at one point goes down a rabbit hole when inspecting uh, two Assyrian reliefs. Okay. So, yeah, this guy and uh, interpreting uh, statues and things is, is, is a thing. Both reliefs depicted Assyrians leading strange beasts of several species in the manner of pets. Mm. The accompanying inscription related that the king of Musri had sent these small beasts called Pagatu as tribute to Ashurnarsilpal. Okay. I hope I have pronounced that name correctly. <laughs> Otherwise, Ashurnarsilpal will probably uh, I don't know, call in and get really angry. <laughs> uh, the text continued that Ashur Narsirpal had bred these animals in his zoological garden at Kala. The inscription on the latter alluded to two other species of beasts called Baziati and Udumi, which had also arrived, arrived as tribute from Musri. Even first suggested that the Pagatu and Baziati were really the pygmies oh of the then relatively of the then relatively recent scientific research and discovery. 
Most importantly, he claimed that the Aryan race had committed bestiality with this lower species, which derived from an earlier and quite distinct branch of animal evolution. The writings of the ancients, the findings of modern archaeology and anthropology, and substantial sections of the Old Testament were supposed to corroborate this terrible practice of miscegenation. The remaining sections of the article were devoted to a meticulous exegesis of the Book of Moses, Job, Enoch, and the prophets in support of his hypothesis. The article thus completed the initial phase in the development of Lanz's neo-Gnostic religion. He had identified the source of all evil in the world and discovered the authentic meaning of the scriptures. I mean, isn't it great when you find you know, the source of all evil and you know all truth? I mean, it must be very the, comforting. The, ans the answer to meaning, the world, the universe, and everything, and it's 42. And it's 42, of course. <laughs> In, in his case, it's like sexy beasts. <laughs> According to his theology, the fall simply denoted the racial compromise of the Aryans due to wicked interbreeding with lower animal spe species and <laughs> species. The consequence of these persistent sins, later institutionalized as satanic cults, was the creation of several mixed races, which threatened the proper and sacred authority of the Aryans throughout the world, especially in Germany, where this race was most numerous. With this definition of sin, the sexo-racist Gnosis offered an explanation for the wretched human condition that lands subjectively perceived in modern Central Europe. I mean, Great. you know, if, if, if you were to make this into like, like I said, into fan fiction, this is so cool because it's so over the top. You know, it's like persistent sin that morphs into satanic cults that then sort of uh, infiltrate every aspect of history and they are actually the basis of different races. Sure, and they, like, with, with, you know, with a slight difference that if this would have been in one of my fandoms, people would have been like, hell yeah, let's enjoy this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's certainly imaginative, but like, uh, you know, there are, there are very outrageous things uh, happening in uh, some fandoms, I'm sure you would agree. I, I, and I mean, outrageous in the sense that it blows your mind because it's like, but like, why? Why, why did you have to imagine of this? Of course, this? of course. Why? But, you know, in... in, in it's like Hogwarts making love to the giant squid. Sure, but, you know, in, Lord, so. in... In my kind of fandoms, these things are done for people's enjoyment and uh, towards nobody's harm. I mean, it's just a way for everybody to enjoy whatever the heck they enjoy without being like, and other people have to suffer for this. Ah, oh, but you see, here is the loophole, because for them, I'm sure that the way they've saw it, it's like, yes, this is for our enjoyment, and we're not really hurting anyone, because anyone has to be human, and we've agreed that these people are subhumans, ergo. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, it, it's that whole thing that uh, um, all men are created equal but you have to be a man to be equal <laughs> sure yeah so yeah getting back to it in 1905 uh, Lance published his fundamental statement of doctrine titled a theozoology or the lore of the Sodom <laughs> aplings and the electron of the gods Oh my god <laughs> I will repeat this because it's <laughs> wonderful and also a mouthful Theo I mean <laughs> I love it. I just, I, I love this title. I know. Theozoology, or the lore of the Sodom aplings and the electron of the gods. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. My God, this is like the best thing ever. Okay. So, so no, tell me about it. Yeah, it was a strange uh, amalgamation of religious beliefs drawn from traditional Hebrew and Christian sources, 
modified in the light of new life sciences, hence the name Theozoology. <laughs> It's, it's, it's the brand new thing, the, kid, the kids dig it. Four chapters entitled Gaia, Earth, Pege, Water, Pir, Fire, and Aiter, Air, uh, describe the satanic realm by relating the story of the for, first pygmy called Adam, who spawned a, a race of beast men, Anthropozoa. <laughs> Lance employed a cryptic scheme of translation whereby the words earth, stone, wood, red, gold, water, fire, and air all connoted beast men for some reason. Okay. While, while the verbs to name, to see, to know, and to cover meant to copulate with... <laughs> I mean, of course. And so on, in order to create a monomaniacal view of the ancient world. <laughs> so, I mean, yes, by all means, if you choose to read something and just replace random words with some other random words, and also it's... random words that are very likely to be quite frequent, <laughs> you know, in, I mean, in, it's, it's like, it's basically yeah. like the memes this day with like, uh, replace uh, one word from any you know title of any movies with dick and like everything is funny yeah <laughs> but you know i have to give it to this guy at least like he really put a lot of thought into the world building of things you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah yeah i mean um by all means like they were writers maybe mediocre writers but they kept at it like they tried more a lot more than i ever do <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah so. so but but maybe it's for the better who knows what i might come up with if i actually did the work heaven forbid let's let's not even go down that path <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah okay so, so anyway, more, anyway after after he was done with the more about the electron of god yeah <laughs> after we, he was done with replacing bread and uh, to see with fuck okay uh, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, he said that the chief pursuit of antiquity appeared to have been the rearing of love pygmies for deviant sexual pleasure. The prime purpose of the Old Testament had been to warn the chosen people, the Aryans, ag against the consequences of this bestial idolatry. Amazing. Yes. Okay. Uh, and also, we all knew that the ancients were uh, quite horny. Although I wouldn't have suspected that they were this horny. But uh, <laughs> okay. I'm naive that way. Uh -huh. in, case, um, in case you were wondering about the electron bit in the title. I mean, I actually, I was. <laughs> Liebenfels claimed that the original unspoiled, so to speak, humans were endowed with extraordinary sensory organs for the transmission and reception of electrical signals. I mean, that is one waste of being endowed and organ. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so okay. They, they, they allegedly had the power of telepathy and omniscience, uh, which they consequently lost because of too much sexy time with their sexy beasts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They fucked themselves out of uh, superpowers, basically. Mm -hmm. These super cool organs had then uh, atrophied into the modern day pituitary and pineal glands. As uh, a doctor, can you confirm this, please? I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> Um, Lipofest wrote that a universal program of segregation could restore these powers to the Aryans because, of course, they were the closest and least imperfect descendants of these initial godmen. Uh, he said that traces of the holy electronic power uh, still prevailed in the old princely dynasties of Germany. Very convenient. Provided yeah. that their pedigree had remained thoroughly noble, these families were the uh, the closest living descendants of the former godman. And since, in his book, these people were the only reason behind any historical progress, they deserved full dominion of the world and its resources. 
an idea that echoed what many Germans felt at the time. Uh, you know, as much as their country had arrived late on the world stage, after the spoils of uh, colonialism had largely, be, largely been divided up. Mm-hmm. Um, Fels also had, um, how should I say this, uh, an interesting, interesting take on Christ and his shenanigans on earth. He interpreted his passion as uh, the attempted rape and perversion by the pygmies. Oh my God. Urged okay. on by the satanic bestial cults devoted to interbreeding throughout history. The Illuminati of sexy time. A century spawning effort to drag down the Aryan race by means of promiscuity. The history of religion described the struggle between the bestial and uh, endogamous cults, basically sexy beasts versus inbreeders united. At the end of this neo manichean temporal scheme stood the promise of final redemption and the second coming. So, I mean, the, <laughs> the man had one, a one-track mind. We can give him that. Um, Lance wasn't just racist. Uh, Guy was also classist as fuck, of course. He accused the poor of indiscriminate hanky-panky with the sexy beasts uh, because they were just so dumb to tell that they were knocking boots with, with like, monsters. Okay. They would have uh, to be exterminated alongside those ever so tempting beasties. Hmm. So, you know, in a nutshell, he seems to just be kill everyone. Except yeah. me and my friends, mm-hmm. basically. Basically. Leaven first fulminated against the false Christian tradition of compassion for the weak and inferior and demanded that the nation deal ruthlessly with the underprivileged. Socialism, democracy, and feminism were the most important targets for this merciless mission on account of their emancipatory force. Women, in particular, were regarded as a special problem since they were supposedly more prone to bestial lust than men. Of course. I've seen this coming. I I knew this was coming. Also, also we can confirm this, right? We can, most definitely. Um, Only their strict subjection to Aryan husbands would uh, guarantee the success of racial purification and the deification of the Aryan race. The process would be accelerated by the humane extermination of the inferior races through an enforced program of sterilization and castration. Mm-hmm. Very humane. Uh, we, we know that people will just line up to get sterilized if you just ask them nicely. His specific recommendations for the disposal of the racial inferiors were various and included deportation to Madagascar, enslavement, incineration as a sacrifice to God, uh, and use as beasts of burden. Again, things you would usually just consent to. Mm-hmm. By the time of World War I, uh, Lance also added another ingredient to this oh, mix of crazy. Awesome. Astrology. He assigned different countries, different signs and planets of the zodiac, and he broke down history into eras pertaining to the 12 signs. So, for instance, the period between 480 1210 was ruled by what he dubbed the spiritual chivalrous master or orders, comprised of the Cistercians, Templars, and Teutonic Knights, because Mars was in Pisces. From 1210 until oh 19, 1920, <laughs> yes, as the ores started to get progressively more uppity, the moon was in Pisces. So, it's all very fishy, of course. Of course. <laughs> Order and hierarchy would then be restored in the period between 1920 and 2640 as the okay. world entered into the age of the lobster. I'm kidding. Uh, because uh, <laughs> Jupiter would be in Pisces. I mean, Pisces, lobsters. Yeah. Close enough. Yeah. Sadly, as we've seen in the case of Guido List, uh, Lenz's work wasn't just some crazy person's howl in the wind. Uh, His message was deeply appealing to fairly powerful people, and as time went on, his patrons included several members of the aristocracy, who had a vested interest in promoting the legitimacy of uh, strongly hierarchical society, but also many well-off middle-class men and women who were feeling threatened by the growing voice of the working class. 
uh, Lee Van Fels also established an order for his followers and uh, they had a lovely ca castle as their uh, HQ where they could role play their increasingly elaborate ceremonies, conduct heraldic research, dream about the, their racist utopias and big surprise, have their beauty contests. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, it's just like everything that is insane just wrapped up <laughs> you know yeah i mean sometimes i wonder if maybe i think uh you know uh, if it wouldn't have been these people it's the conditions were ripe certainly for some other people to to take of their course. place uh but you know jokingly yeah. uh sometimes i wonder if these people would have been um better adapted in a world in which uh, things like, I don't know, cosplay, fan fiction, furry conventions <laughs> would have been a sort no, of accepted they thing. They wouldn't have, because nowadays we have all of that. We have, mm -hmm. we have these uh, options where you can just go and have fun and play with ideas. And still, there are people who just want to go and, you know, shit all over everything. Because some, some people just want other people to be miserable. They don't just want to enjoy things for themselves. It is also very important for them that other people don't enjoy things. I mean, even in today's fandoms and in today's fan fiction, there are some people who just, you know, are just there uh, to constantly discuss how people are fandoming wrong. <laughs> okay so gatekeepers it's, yeah no it, it doesn't matter what you give some people they they would just not be happy mm -hmm. i guess mm -hmm. oh, so this this was very entertaining i mean as far as insanity goes at mm -hmm. least they were you know inventive yeah yeah i mean yeah. uh it's it's I guess the the reason why I said it's the lore behind the fascist ideas is because, yeah, you have to, uh, as as we've discussed previously, you uh, have to grab them not just by the brain, but grab them by the fancy, so to speak. Yeah, because if you if you uh, you know they might agree with the ideas, and it helps them to put uh, an argument across when they try to persuade others or when they try to defend themselves in public. But what actually drives people and gets them through, <clears throat> um, I don't know, the, the, the hostility that they might encounter when they, uh, uh, when they display their, their ideas yeah. uh, is uh, this, this fancy of them being special, of them being part of this exciting world that has like clashes of uh, different races, Atlanteans, Lemurians, Hyperborea, um, you know, sexy beasts trying to, you know, bring civilization down by being ever so tempting. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's... Uh, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's, story, it's, it, yeah. It, it's, it's storytelling. We, yeah. we enjoy that since, you know, ever. Yeah. I don't have anything else planned for the outro. <laughs> Would you like to <laughs> add uh, anything else? So I guess one thing that came to mind um, after uh, our discussion of these uh, crazy stories is um, a quote from Terry Pratchett from Witches of Road. Um, where it said, um, find the story, Granny Weatherworks always said. She believed that the world was full of story shapes. If you let them, they controlled you. But if you studied them, if you found out about them, you could use them, you could change them. And uh, also, um, in Terry Pratchett in Witches Abroad, there is also this quote that says, people think that stories are shaped by people. In fact, it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, stories shape people, not people shape stories. So if you have this rich lore, it's easier to shape even, you know, terrible, mm -hmm. horrible things. Yeah. And people accept it easier. 
and also I because think this, they will uh, be shaped by these stories. Uh, this also uh, um, gels with the whole uh, question of, oh, but uh, is so and so uh, was so and so really racist or uh, was he just uh, cynical? And you know, at the end of the day. Uh, besides the fact that it doesn't really matter because their mm -hmm. actions still have consequences. Uh, it's very likely exactly. that even if at the beginning you didn't necessarily uh, believe that or you were just just using them, using those ideas mm -hmm. for ulterior means, if you play the part long enough, <laughs> chances yeah. are you become the character you're playing. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Well, I think we can wrap this up for now and uh, we'll see you uh, next episode. Bye, guys. Bye.